Danielle Picard is a Florida Power and Lights electric vehicle and in-home technology analyst. Her responsibilities include tracking, forecasting, and reporting on industry trends of electric vehicles and new technologies, managing the installation of electric vehicle charging stations, responding to customer inquiries, internal and external outreach presentations, and community event support. She has a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Minnesota in Strategic Communications. Daniel, thank you for coming today. How's everyone doing today? Good. Um, I'm Danielle Picard. I work for Florida Power and Light. Um, thank you for letting me be here. You know, I'm Anne Louise's replacement, so please be kind. Um, I want to start out with a couple of questions. How many of you have actually seen an electric vehicle on the road today in Florida? Show of hands. Good amount of you. How many of you have actually been inside of an electric vehicle? Good amount. Well, those of you that didn't raise your hand, you'll be able to do that today because we've actually parked our electric vehicles right outside of the uh, building here today. So you'll be able to answer yes to all those questions uh, moving forward. All right, first we're going to talk about the benefits of electric vehicles. Um, as you know, everyone here is probably very aware of why they're good, but there's some really specific reasons um, that we want to point out of why you should really be interested in supporting and driving an electric vehicle. Uh, the first is the cost savings. Um, electric vehicles are 80% cheaper than driving a gas-powered car. And in fact, um, when you do the math, it's actually 77 cents a gallon or per charge, which is a lot cheaper than you know, $3 a gallon, $4 a gallon with gas uh, prices fluctuating. Additionally, maintenance costs. Um, I don't know about you, but I really don't enjoy getting an oil change. It's always at an inconvenient time. With electric vehicles, you don't have to do that. Um, another joke we like to share is, um, how many moving parts do you think there are? Or just name the six moving parts in an electric vehicle. Anyone have any ideas what those might be? Think of windshield wipers? Windshield? And the four tires, the windshield wipers and the four tires, that's the answer. Oh, and the steering wheel, we're talking about the, yeah, okay, so there's a, one more for the, everyone's really technical in here, but yeah, so maybe there's now uh, seven. <laughs> uh, another reason is that they have zero tailpipe emissions. Um, obviously, everyone likes them because they're clean. Um, some of the challenges we face with electric vehicles, they say, well, they're generated from, you know, power plants. Well, the good news is, uh, most of the power here in Florida is generated from clean fuel sources like natural gas, nuclear power, and renewable energy. And if you're an FPL customer, it's an even better deal for you because we have the lowest rates in the state. So charging with us is even is an even better value and even cleaner than in some other states. Another important um, benefit is that it's actually most of electricity is generated off of domestic fuel sources. So we foreign oil, we don't actually generate a lot of electricity using foreign oil where gasoline, that's a completely different story and a different ballgame. Uh, and at FPL, we've actually reduced our foreign oil use by 98% in the last like six years. So uh, we're making huge strides in that area and, and that also affects um, how clean your vehicle is. Another really important reason and probably the most important, kind of like what Andrew said, um, thanks, um, is also how fun they are to drive. Um, I'm a little bit new to electric vehicles, but I've been lucky enough to drive electric vehicles um, a lot in the last month, and I can tell you they're super fun to drive. They have torque, they have way better pickup than a gas-powered car. They're smooth, the transition, even between if you're going from electric to gas power, very smooth transition, super fun to drive, and I highly recommend everyone to test drive one in the future. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the state of electric vehicles in the US and in Florida. As you can see here, um, may not seem like huge numbers, but they're making huge strides. So we actually have in the United States over 160,000 U.S. vehicles on the market uh, with a huge growth, growth path there. In Florida, we actually... The latest numbers are over 6,000. I just ran the latest query there. Um, and what's very interesting to point out is that 
When hybrids came out, electric vehicles are already double the pace of growth of what, when original hybrids came out. So they're growing at a much faster pace than when hybrids came out. A uh, huge growth curve here. And Florida right now has 4% of the market share of electric vehicles in the United States. So where are the cars? So not surprisingly, most of the cars are in South Florida, uh, where the major population centers are. Um, you know, Dade, Broward County, Palm Beach, and then along Central Florida. What's interesting is we actually did an analysis um, for the propensity to buy an electric vehicle. So we looked at, for every 10,000 resident, how many electric vehicles are there in that county? What's awesome is that Palm Beach County was actually the highest propensity to buy an electric vehicle. And not surprisingly, most of you raised your hands here today because you've seen one on the road, and that makes sense. Um, also to point out, Martin County and some of the smaller counties, when you look at it from that ratio, they actually show up on the list as, you know, per the amount of people in their county, there's a lot more electric vehicles there. So there are some um, counties that are really embracing electric vehicles, and there's a lot that can be done in this area. Uh, and I think it's going to continue to move forward in a lot of counties in Florida. Just like Andrew, you know, there's a lot of great cars on the market. Um, I've been lucky enough to drive a few. I haven't test driven a Tesla yet. It's on my list. Um, so uh, gotten to drive the Volt, really awesome. I actually really enjoyed the Leaf, um, being a little bit of a new electric vehicle driver. I was a little nervous about driving a Leaf, you know, that charge anxiety, I didn't have it at all. Actually, it's as easy as just plugging in your cell phone. Um, I literally, you know, I was talking to someone earlier today and they said, well, You've got to get it rigged up for your house to make it work. And I said, actually, you don't. You just literally can plug it into your garage, go to bed, wake up in the morning, and it's got a full charge. So um, I think that's a big uh, misconception out there that you have to make a lot of investment into charging technology to really you know, purchase one of these vehicles, and that's really not the case. Um, additionally, um, a lot more vehicles are coming on the market. Some of the vehicles up here are not all available in the US yet, but the good news is they're coming. Um, the Mitsubishi Outlander, you know, they're actually coming out with some sport utility model, models of electric vehicles. And uh, the BMW i3 is coming out later this year. Uh, additionally, even though vehicles aren't available in Florida, a lot of customers are getting really savvy about bringing them into the state. So I actually do our electric vehicle queries, and I can see that there's actually, I think, five uh, RAV4s, which aren't even available all electric or excuse me, for partially electric models in the state of Florida, and there's about five in state. So if, if you're looking for an electric vehicle, there's a way to bring it in, and customers and, and, and uh, residents are doing that. Another area for growth with electric vehicles is fleet vehicles and businesses. Businesses are embracing electrification and electric vehicles. Um, one of the cool things is that electric vehicles for, for businesses, they actually have the ability, some models, can actually work as a generator, so you can actually drive the car in electric and then use it as a generator power, other things on a work site. Um, for FPL, we're actually investing in this and we are actually working with businesses to try to help electrify their fleet and look at their electrification needs and work with them for a model that fits them. So um, we think this is a very exciting area for growth uh, for the future. I've been talking generally about electric vehicles, but there's actually three different types. Uh, the first type is the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. And this is what you've uh, seen as like the, Pli the Prius hybrid, or actually what we've brought today, which is the Ford C-Max. Um, they tend to have a smaller battery, so they also have a smaller electric range. They usually range from 10 to 30 miles on a charge, and then they go to gas power. So actually, and at certain speeds, they actually blend electric power and gas power. So it's not a this or that. At certain speeds, it will actually use a little bit of both. Um, the next type of vehicle is the extended range electric vehicle. These are the Chevy Volts. Um, these vehicles have a little bit of a larger battery, and you actually start with the charge, and you can use electric or gas power. So it doesn't actually blend it at any point. You're either on electric or you're on gas power. Um, and these obviously uh, have a little bit of a larger range, and what uh, Chevy looked at was that um, people typically drive, I think you said 60, I think they showed their research was about 40 miles a day. So you know, they believe that you could, with 40 miles on electric, if you don't take long trips, that should be sufficient for your everyday needs. Uh, next one, the Tesla uh, 
is the same. It's a battery, all, all electric powered electric vehicle. So this is fully on operated off of electricity. And these range uh, from, you know, they can go from up to 300 or as much as 80 uh, for a range on a full charge. Um, I was very surprised at how uh, comfortable I was out of the gate with a battery powered electric vehicle. You know, I'm so used to gasoline, I didn't think, I was like, oh, well, I'm gonna get stranded. It's super easy, you don't use as much, you know, you don't go as far as you think you do every day. And the way I think about it is, with your cell phone, you never go to a zero charge. Every day you're just used to plugging in and getting ready to go. Similar with this, it's, it's really that easy. I came home from work, I plugged it into my outlet in the garage, went to sleep, did the same thing again in the morning. Super easy. So um, I think that's a lot of the, the myths out there is um, you really don't need to, to have a lot of equipment to be ready for an electric vehicle in your life. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about charging. There are three different types of charging. There's two main types that I'm going to talk about up here, and I'll mention the third one a little bit later. The first type is AC charging. So when I talked about plugging your phone into the wall or plugging it into the garage, that's actually level one charging. You don't need to have any special electrical upgrades. That's just plugging your car with the charger, came, charger it came with and plugging it into an outlet and plugging the other part into your car. And with that, you can get about three to five miles per hour on a charge. So if you're going to bed on eight hours, you could probably charge up, depending on what type of electric vehicle you have and how depleted you are, you usually be good to go in the morning. Level two, this is you know, what Teslas typically have. It requires some uh, an electrician to come out to your home and upgrade your system a little bit. Um, it will charge at a bit of a faster pace. Uh, so those are the two main types of home charging needs. What you've probably heard more about is DC fast charging. This, some people mistakenly call this level three charging. That's actually not true. Um, in the future, they might have level three charging for AC, DC, and another type I'll mention earlier. So they're actually, this is not level three charging, it's DC fast charging. Um, Teslas have actually invested in DC fast charging around, around the country. So they're actually installing fast charging stations, um, which means that they'll, they'll be able to charge your car at a much faster rate. Um, these are a lot more complicated. There's actually three different standards of DC fast charging. Tesla, as I mentioned, has their model. It only charges Tesla models, and it's free for Tesla owners. Another type of charge, uh, DC fast charge is the CHAdeMO standard. That charges all the Nissan vehicles. Another standard is the SAE standard, which charges all, all the other vehicles at a much cheaper rate. But as you can see, it's very complicated with DC charging because it's not, there's not a one standard fits all. And some cars actually aren't even equipped to take a DC fast charge. So there's a lot of complications in this area. Um, and that's the area where you see a lot of public charging. So there's a lot to be done there to sort of figure out what's the standard, what's an efficient cost. Um, but what seems to be working well are the level one and level two at home and at work. Charging locations. Um, as I mentioned, I was really surprised, but charging at home is super easy and it's actually 80% of people, 80 to 90% of people charge at home or at work. It's that easy. Um, additionally, destination charging, we see a big future for there for public charging. Um, the destination, you know, they're considering workplace and fleet a destination. It's anywhere you're parked for a long period of time. So think about the Sawgrass Mall, the uh, sports stadium, even the new Palm Beach Mall that's about to be built. And I actually did just hear uh, from Amy that they're gonna be building a charging station at the new Palm Beach Outlet Mall, which I think is awesome. Uh, we also believe that there's a big opportunity for destination charging along uh, major highways and corridors. Obviously, you know, people are going long distance and need to charge. It's a great location for people to be able to do it. What tends to get most of the attention, but is actually probably doesn't make them the least amount of sense is um, local retail, local retailers. So this is like Whole Foods, um, Whole Foods, restaurants, things like that, places you're not gonna be for that long period of time. I don't know about you, but I'm not gonna be at Whole Foods as much as I love it for four hours. So why would you pay for a higher rate of charge? It most likely wouldn't be free. The retailers and the businesses actually get to set the price. And a lot of times they range from being free to free or, or can be quite expensive. So. Uh, while this gets a lot of attention, it, it doesn't really make business sense uh, a lot of times for businesses to be putting them in, unless it's a type of business where you'd stay at for a long period of time. 
We have a great website with tons of resources and information. We have fact sheets. We have questions and answers. Um, we have information about charging at multi-dwelling units. We even have a little game on our website where you can actually drive a vehicle and test drive different cars. We actually have information on the different models. We're a great resource. Uh, you can uh, go to our website at www.fpl.com slash electric vehicles. We also answer any customer questions through our shared mailbox, uh, which is electric vehicles dash electric dash vehicles at fpl.com. Um, so a lot of great information out there. Um, I still have a lot to learn about electric vehicles, but I'm telling you, there's nothing to be afraid of. Super easy to do. Uh, it's just like charging in your phone. That's my main message of today. So thank you. I'm sorry? I'm not sure. I'll have to find out. I'm not sure about the technical specs on all the different batteries. Is that what you're asking? The, the, what's the... charging for cell phones, oh, look at this, um, where we actually don't plug it in anymore. It's inductive charging, we just put That's it on some point. plate. Do you know if somebody yeah. is thinking about that, I just drive on a parking lot, there's a plate in the ground, mm -hmm. something like that? Yep, and actually that's a good point. I, had, I didn't actually get to that, but there's actually, the third type of charging technology is now wireless charging. So that actually, where they'll actually put something on the ground or even bury it, and you'll actually be able to charge your car. So there's actually now three different types, and there'll be level ones, level twos, and level threes for wireless charging as well. It's actually the technology exists, yep. and it works quite well. A lot of it's kind of coming up with standards. And to be honest, standards is the biggest problem with both DC charging and with inductive charging. It's getting all of the manufacturers to agree to one system. And it's already a problem even with the, as you mentioned, Tesla. Though I'm a big Tesla fan, I gotta say, one thing I've really been disappointed with Tesla in is they've got proprietary technology for charging yeah. their cars, and they're not sharing. And mm -hmm. that is gonna become a problem. It's gonna be the same type of thing that you got with your cell phone that you used to have, that you have like a full entire drawer full of chargers <laughs> every time the thing changed over. You can't do that. It is coming. The thing that's holding it back is it's coming up with standards for it. And I'd actually heard that I think Chatamo was actually building an SAE uh, kind of extension or adapter. Yeah. So they're kind of getting there, but as you said, it's it's not really there yet. It's Everyone's big, kind of. It's a big fight between the SAE, Chatamo, and then you got broke people like Tesla that are out there. Yep. And, um, DHS versus Betamax. Yes, sir. Yes, I just had a comment on the uh, inductive charging. Um, Nissan Leaf actually has some con conceptual designs on how to charge uh, the Nissan in the garage and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think what's going to be an issue there is the electromagnetic uh, uh, intensity that we're talking about is going to be different than cell phones. And the health issues related to electromagnetic induction is going to be part of what Nissan, I think, is looking at as far as will you have um, health effects with uh, the EM? Okay. Hi. Mm -hmm. And I was just I was just in Israel and the guide, whether he knows or not, said they've abandoned it. Have you looked into Israel? Because they look like they were really 
going quite forward with a country for electric cars? Our main focus, I think, has been the, the United States and what we're looking at, but I'm, I'm going to be researching in my, in my role, uh, kind of looking at the global scale with a focus on the U.S., but um, I haven't personally heard about that, but I, something I'll look into because I, I haven't heard about that. Yeah, interesting. Yes. Yeah, do you have any reaction to the guy in Georgia back in December who was, uh, went to see his son play tennis and plugged his leaf in and got arrested or got fined by the police? For stealing electricity. <laughs> well, I know that um, you know th there's definitely needs to be policies and laws about where you're allowed to charge. And obviously, you know, you own your home. Work your workplace may or may not have a workplace charging policy. You ha you know, electricity is paid for by someone. So that you know, that, you know, if it's not offered, you shouldn't probably plug it in where where it doesn't belong. <laughs> I think it's yeah, that sounds like a separate issue, but. <laughs> Yeah, in other words, just sharing because there are so many large utilities in this uh, country, and if you all do independent thinking, uh, I think it would be better if you all work together. Yep. Uh, actually, my, my colleague who is here, she's actually on the board of, of some of the leading uh, utility boards in the country, and we just actually met as a group with all the Florida utilities with, with electric vehicle folks on their team. I actually just sat in, that, in on that meeting. and. What's awesome is everyone's kind of on the same page. Everybody's really getting behind this and starting to come together to form groups because I think it doesn't make sense to everyone to do their own research. We realized that we were all kind of going after the same thing, so we might actually go in and pull data together um, as a large group instead of us each sort of running numbers uh, separately. So actually, what's awesome is utilities tend to work together, and, and that's what I'm seeing with electric vehicles. For example, the IEEE, I know the IEEE over the last uh, well, few years really has been evolving the standards for a smart grid. And certainly in order to make mass, uh, to have a, a mass uh, install of charging stations, it's going to be some compatibility on that side. But I'm wondering, is there an IEEE standard that has been presented for charging? Or is it just, as you mentioned, SAE and these rogue that's like all, Tesla? Or? That's all that I, I know about at this time. I know that, you know, some of the issue is people are putting in charging stations and they're not really thinking about location or if it makes sense. So some of them are going idle. So I think instead of just putting charging stations everywhere, we really need to look at where it really makes sense. Okay. Because I think, um, you know, just putting them everywhere and not having them draw any power, um, we need to really look at. There's actually, you can get a lot farther than people think. So it's really looking at where we believe is the destination charging you know, charging stations at sporting events, at places where people drive a long distance. If people aren't going to stay there a long time, people likely aren't going to pay an extra price to fuel up there. Right, yeah. Yes. And um, there are actually quite a few down here in South Florida already. Um, I know they're down in the uh, parking garage in downtown uh, Palm Beach. Uh, they're in Delray. Quite a few of them around, and they all use what's called the J1772 uh, connection, which is what the leaf and the bolts and most manufacturers are using. Kind of a funny flip part about that with Tesla is the Tesla guys not that they pull out of after. <laughs> So yeah, in kind of extension of, of my question about an IEEE standard, are any of these charging stations already set up compatible where they can communicate, like for example, FPL on, on uh, your uh, software uh, for microgrid management, you know, like in terms of you have smart meters, is there any sort of smart metering already on these charging stations for monitoring and control of load, for load management? No, not currently at this time. There is for sale. By the companies who put them in, they have a technology to monitor, but not specifically FPL. I know. I'm kind of curious. I would assume that FPL has factored this into their 10 year generation forecast. You know, in planning for building plants, <clears throat> have you made an assessment, say, five years down the road, how that's really going to affect your uh, system load and the generating capacity? Yes, actually. And profits, too, of course. <laughs> That, that I'm not too sure about, but what I can say is um, we actually did a reliability study, 
uh, you know, in California and other places, load's completely different. So a lot of, in California, people don't use their air conditioners. They, some people don't have them. So putting a car, plugging a car into the grid is like the equivalent of adding a house over there. Here, it's like adding maybe another air conditioner. So we're, we're not concerned about our reliability. Um, for us, it's going to be kind of a drop in the bucket uh, as far as the, the extra load we can see from that. And we have no concerns about reliability from that standpoint. Yeah. Just, just one more question. Uh, in the world we live in today, uh, <coughs> cars are almost becoming consumables. After three years, people lease them and they, you know, they throw them away. I haven't seen an analysis of cost of ownership for like three years versus electric and gas. What's the difference? I mean, the bottom line is, practically speaking, people are going to look at price. That's the bottom line. And uh, I haven't seen any analysis here at all. What is the cost of ownership of electric versus gas, let's say for a three year period? Well, I know that one thing I, I didn't mention is that actually the batteries are under warranty for about eight to 10 years. So that's actually, so I think the you know, looking at that, the longer you own the car, the, the more cost effective it will be for you. So I think if anyone's, you know, buying or selling a car after three years, I don't think that's a good value proposition, gas or electric. So, you know, the yeah, like I said, you, most people, well, I don't think they don't keep cars that long. Yeah, and <laughs> but it's more of like because of emotional benefits. You, as somebody that's more affluent, may not keep your car that long, but that car gets passed on to somebody else. And one more thing, there is the, the federal tax incentive up to $7,500 for electric vehicles, which is what you don't have for, for gas-powered cars. So, Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.